In the summer of 1974, there was a big camp in the southern part of the Soviet Union. More than 170 brave hikers gathered, all set to climb Lenin Peak. Among them were eight fearless Russian women. They had a bold dream to be the first all-female team to conquer the peak, but things took an unexpected turn. As they were coming back down, a huge storm trapped them on top of the mountain, and they faced a terrible tragedy. This is their story. Lenin Peak, the towering 7,134-meter giant of the trans Range in Central Asia, on the border of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, stood as a challenge and a dream for many climbers. Among them was Elvera Shataeva, a renowned Russian mountaineer who made her mark in the climbing world and was among the most famous athletes in the USSR. She had been granted the role Master of Sport, a top credential in the Soviet Union, and one that is rarely given to women. Compared to other high-altitude mountains, Lenin Peak is certainly not the biggest, nor is it considered a technical challenge, making it a popular choice to climb. In fact, it has one of the highest ascent rates of all 7,000-meter peaks globally, with each year hundreds of climbers reaching the summit. But despite its reputation as one of the less technically challenging climbs, Lenin Peak presents formidable obstacles, unpredictable weather, freezing temperatures, and the constant threat of avalanches, all exacerbated by the extreme altitude which had thwarted many attempts in the past. Shataiva, with her expertise and fame as an athlete, despite the wishes of her peers, decided to lead an all-female expedition of eight climbers to conquer this formidable peak. In the 1970s, women were rarely seen as equals to men, and so this was an opportunity for Shataiva to prove just that. Perhaps her familiarity with Lennon Peak played a role in her decision. She had scaled its heights before, albeit as part of a mixed group, which included her husband, Vladimir Shataiva. In June 1974, a bustling international mountaineering camp sprawled across the southern Soviet Union, nestled on the border of modern-day Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan in the Pamirs, home to some of the world's loftiest peaks. This was the first major American expedition allowed in the Soviet Union, as the event was held to showcase the developing relationship between the USSR and the West. Among the 170 climbers hailing from various nations, 19 Americans stood out, including two women representing the 1974 American expedition. Molly Higgins, a 24-year-old, recalls meeting Shataiva briefly, finding her aspiring. Arlene Blom, part of the Swiss team, also remembers conversing briefly with Shataiva, who shared her group's goal of becoming the first all-female team to conquer Lennon Peak. While bonding over their shared ambition, Arlene voiced concerns about the equipment Shataiva's team had, noting their dated tents with button closures and old-fashioned boots. With the unpredictable weather on Linden Peak in mind, Arlene questioned if their gear was adequate. According to other climbers on the mountain, the Russian team departed base camp for Camp 1 on July 30th, then proceeded towards the summit via the Lipkin route the following day. The ascent progressed smoothly until August 3rd when Shataiva called for a rest day due to cloudy weather and whiteout conditions reported between Camp 2 and 3. A whiteout occurs in snowy areas when objects don't cast shadows, reducing or blocking visual references like the horizon or terrain features. On August 4th, reports indicated a major storm was on the horizon, advising all mountain climbers to descend. Shataiva's team, apparently 400 feet below the summit, was observed walking in a line upwards. The next day, on August 5th, the Russian team radioed from the summit, reaching the top. By 5 p.m. that same day, they radioed to base camp from about 400 meters below the summit. Visibility had been deteriorating, prompting them to set up tents to wait for the storm to pass. Following this, there are slight discrepancies in the accounts according to Shataiva's husband, Vladimir. Base camp advised them with two options, either wait out the night or descend immediately if feasible. Another version, as described by Robert Craig in Storm and Sorrow, states that base camp instructed them to wait until morning and then descend via the same Lipkin route they had ascended. The team opted to wait out the night. The morning of August 6th, 
brought five inches of snow. Shataiva radioed about worsening winds. They attempted to descend, but were only able to progress a few hundred feet before encountering hurricane force winds in the early hours in the morning, which destroyed their tents and carried away any untied gear. Shataiva's team communicated again, detailing their struggles with continuous whiteout conditions and escalating winds. They also noted the illness of one woman and the unwell condition of another. The team leader instructed them to descend in search of snow suitable for digging shelter caves. According to Robert Craig, it was implied that if the sick women couldn't move, an adequate shelter couldn't be achieved. Leaving her behind might be necessary for the group's survival. During the descent, one team member Irina tragically perished while holding a safety rope for others. Attempts to dig caves in the hard snow proved futile. Instead, they managed to erect two tents on a ridge just a few hundred feet below the summit. The health of the alien climbers deteriorated further, prompting the instruction for those still mobile to continue descending. Shataiva agreed with this plan. The subsequent timeline is unclear due to varying accounts. However, either on that day or the following one, two more ill climbers from the Russian expedition passed away. The five women left sought shelter from the fierce winds in one tent, lacking poles and with only three sleeping bags, they huddled together for the night. On the morning of August 7th, two Japanese climbers attempted a rescue mission but were thwarted by strong winds forcing them to retreat. Many climbers tried to help, but they were too far down the mountain to do much. Shataiva reported that some members of the group are deteriorating and getting sick. Despite being advised to, the women refused to leave anyone behind. Their last messages showed that they were sad, cold, and that they couldn't go on anymore. 10 AM, Shataiva. It is very sad here where it was once so beautiful. At noon, one more had died, two were dying. They are all gone now. That last asked, when will we see the flowers again? Two others earlier asked about their children. Now it is no use. At 3.30 PM, we are sorry. We have failed you. We tried so hard. Now we are so cold. Base camp, in despair, promised to rescue is underway. At 4 PM, the transmission was unclear, but another woman seemed to have died. Three remained. Winds up high were estimated at 80 to 100 miles per hour. The summit temperatures at minus 30 to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. At 6.30 PM, another has died. We cannot go through another night. I do not have the strength to hold down the transmitter button. And finally at 8.30 PM, now we are two and now we will all die. We are very sorry. We tried, but we could not. Please forgive us. We love you. Goodbye. The next day, the American team went up to the mountain and found Shataiva's body along with their campsite and others. They used a radio from a Japanese team to tell base camp what they saw. A week later, Shataiva's husband and some others went up to bring back the bodies. The tragedy has multiple causes. One factor that is highlighted is inadequate equipment. The team also faced immense pressure, being the first all-female group and under scrutiny from numerous other teams. Many doubted the women's ability, driving Shataiva to prove them wrong and potentially causing a reckless determination. Moreover, it was evident that Shataiva also felt a profound responsibility for her team, echoed by fellow climbers. Their loyalty to one another led them to refuse leaving anyone behind. Speculation arose, including some from Shataiva's husband, suggesting she may have intentionally prolonged the climb, such as by calling a rest day on August 3rd to distance themselves from male support teams and assert their independence. Hindsight reveals that by passing this rest day might have positioned them lower on the mountain when the storm struck. Despite this, the concept of an all-female ascent is not novel. Women have a rich history in mountaineering. Women's contributions to mountaineering stretch back centuries with figures like Mary Perrette and Harriette D'Angville making significant summits. Despite initial skepticism and societal barriers, women have increasingly made their mark in mountaineering, showcasing their competence and resilience.